It's my opportunity this morning to, uh, we'll have a scripture reading right after me, but to introduce uh, Brother June to those of you who weren't in Bible class, Brother June Fuentes, who is the director of Heritage Bible College in Baguio City, Philippines. Uh, we established work, our relationship, our work with them uh, just shortly after this time last year when Brother June visited. He has got his wonderful wife, Anna, here with us. Uh, I know it's been great for Cindy and I to have them here uh, this weekend because we, we grew a great friendship in the few days we were able to spend in the Philippines and also all of the communication we've had over the last year and a wonderful work that they're doing over there. Uh, the students, if you were in Bible class, you got to see what they did. By the way, that uh, if you weren't in Bible class, we recorded that. So if you wish to see it, it will be, uh, we'll put it on the website as well so you can, uh, you can watch that. Uh, but Brother June and, and uh, Sister Anna are back stateside for at least another month or so and then headed back for the work uh, in the Philippines. But the work hasn't stopped. He continues to kind of manage the interns that are working for, that'll be the year two students next year. So uh, he's, he's been uh, doing double duty, but we're certainly glad to have them here with us. Certainly glad, I know the elders are, certainly glad of the partnership that we currently have with them and looking forward to what we will be doing uh, in the future. So like I said, we'll have a, a Bible reading and then uh, Brother June. Scripture reading this morning will be from the uh, book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah, speaking of himself, says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he, said, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Again, I would like to express our thank uh, to God for allowing us to come over to the elders uh, that we had a a great time visiting with the past couple of days and also to the church here for your partnership uh, with us in what we do in the Philippines. Uh, thank you so much for having us. I was uh, told, heard, I read it too. I just want to verify that in the United States Naval Academy, the plebes, the freshmen, one of the uh, courses that they have to take as a freshman is boxing. So you start thinking, why boxing? And it was told it's not just to build stamina uh, for their physique, but there's a very important leadership lesson that goes along with not only learning how to box, 
but being in the ring with another person. And they said it's about getting hit and what you're going to do once you got hit. They are being trained to become leaders. But there's a lot of things that you do expect, but you don't really expect, especially when it comes to what reaction would come out of us. Somebody said that uh, every boxer had a plan when they stepped into the ring until they got hit, until they got hit in the face. And then it's to whom it may concern. They just abandon all their plan and uh, they, just, they would just go toe for toe. We train for, we, we train leaders in the school. I don't teach boxing. Because I don't know how to box. But I tried to teach the same principle. What do you do when times get difficult? When it becomes rough? But the best way really to teach that I believe is allow them to experience it. Now, in the school, it's kind of difficult uh, for the student to experience exactly what they're going to experience in the field because the field is much, much more difficult. But to a certain degree, uh, they will experience some uh, difficulties. And so one of the things I would do, and I'm hoping, that uh, none of the students would be able to watch this. One of the things that I would do with the students is, especially if it's a go-getter, it's one of those uh, students that when you ask, okay, who wants to do this, who wants to volunteer for this, it's one of those students that would always raise up their, their hands. They want to do everything because they believe that they could do it. Or they have done it in the past. And so they, they believe that they're ready for leadership position. And so I would pick them and give them work to do. And typically, I'll give them work to do that it's going to be difficult or impossible for them to do it by themselves. They need people's cooperation. And so they will take it on. They know how, what to do and how to go about uh, doing it. And they'll do it for a little while. And I have this uh, uh, one student when he was still a student. And... Uh, he would do that in every, every time, you know, I said, who wants to take the lead on this and who wants to do this? He would always raise his hand. And he's, was, he, he's one of those go-getters. And it's uh, basically uh, his personality is my way or the highway. Once I get the position of leadership, then you watch out because uh, you, you, you're going to do what uh, I think needs to be done. So he would, he would take on several of these responsibilities. And then, so I'll give him what I think would be the most difficult, could, not, could be not the most difficult, but I know that he would need everyone else's cooperation to be able to do the job. Three months later, he came up to me and he said, uh, sir, I don't want a job anymore. Can you give me a different work to do? I said, why? And then he gave me, of course, all these excuses. And basically, every single ex reason that he would give me is it's someone else's fault. He was not able to do the job because it's someone else's fault. So we went around that uh, reasoning for a little while. I would say, I said, if that is the case, then try to do this and try to do this. Now, without changing any of his strategy in the way he deal with people, nothing has really changed. So he would come back to me again and say, man, they're really difficult people. They're this way and this way. And then until such time, because I don't, I said, you stay in that job, you continue to do it. Until such a time he came back and he said, I think I don't know how to lead. I said, that's a good start. So what do you think needs to be done? And then he went through this process, but he said, you know, that's not me. There's, there's no way I could do it that way. I said, you better learn that because when you get to the field, when you work for congregations, that's exactly what's going to happen. 
He said, what's the most difficult, what's the, the most important lesson you learned from this exercise? And then he gave me all kinds of reason, uh, lesson learned. That's not the answer. It's not wrong or right answer. It's just, it's, it's just that it's not the answer I'm looking for. I said, no, that's not it. And then he went, uh, he, he has a list of reasons, but I know that he knows. So I'm waiting for him to say it instead of me telling him what it is, especially in his case. And then finally he said, it's difficult to lead when nobody wants to listen. I said, why is that the case? He said, because I don't have influence over them. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. The Lord said, Whom shall we send? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Perhaps one of the most popular verses in the book of Isaiah, all of its 66 books, that one verse. Six, eight. A number of songs were written inspired by that one verse. And one of them would be the song we just sang. But the two verses following, immediately following verse 8, verses 9 and 10 would read this way. He said, go and tell this people. After Jeremiah, uh, after Isaiah said, here am I, Lord send me. Then God said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive, keep on looking, but do not understand, render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Basically, what God is telling Isaiah is, since you volunteered, you go. Did you notice that? I say I didn't know what his uh, responsibility is going to be, but he said yes. He said I'm willing to go. And then later on, he found out what he's what he's going to do. What he's really going to do is he's going to bring the message to Israel, to the nation of Israel. But at the same time, at the very at the get-go, God is already telling him they are not going to listen to you. You go anyway. It's not because of the influence of, I say I don't have influence over Israel. It's just the hardening of the heart of the Israelites, rejecting the message of God. But the point we're trying to make is that Isaiah, as a servant of God, saying yes to God, I'm going, and then realizing afterwards that this is not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be difficult. And he went and he found out that it's really difficult to talk to these people. Much more have them do what God is telling them to do. And basically, they have to repent. So the question is, what then? So what are we going to do in ministry? Because we're talking about ministry. Any ministry that we are in, there, are, there will be difficulties. Any ministries that we're in, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when you're hit in the face, because you will be hit in the face. There will be some tough times, there will be some difficulty. You're coming in into a ministry with that mindset. And perhaps that's the reason why some people doesn't want to go into ministry. Because we know that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when you get hit in the face. So what are you going to do now? But for those who said yes, but then the question is, so what 
are we going to do now that we found out that being in ministry is be going to be very difficult or any kind of responsibilities for that matter there will be some difficulties are we going to abandon the plan are we going to abandon what God is telling us of course we don't want to do that but the question is so how do we go about making sure that we stay on course that we are going to be successful. So I chose uh, the story of Isaiah because being in ministry, specifically, we're talking about ministry, being in ministry is a marathon. It's a long distance run. And Isaiah was in it for more than 40 years. Some would say 42, some would say 46. But that 46 long years is the time when Israel is really going to be in trouble. The time when uh, people doesn't want to listen. They want to go about doing their own business. And the last thing they wanted to hear or see is a prophet from God. But Isaiah stayed the course. Isaiah kept on preaching the word of God. So perhaps there are lessons that we could learn from the life of Isaiah that would also help us. Stay the course, continue, be faithful even in the face of adversity or difficulties in ministry or any kind of responsibility that we have given to us by God. Three things that I would like to mention this morning. One is that it is very important for us that when we say yes, Tom asked me, what's the title of the lesson? So I said, yes, Lord, yes. Because I thought, I thought that's what Isaiah said in 6-8, uh, right? Here am I, send me. But also at the same time, when he asked me, there's a song that keeps playing in my head. And the title of that song is, Yes, Lord, Yes. You know? And that song said, Yes, Lord, Yes, Yes to your will and to your ways. So when we said, Yes, Lord, so that we would stay in that capacity, in what God has called us for, there are three things that we could learn from Isaiah. And the first one is that when we say yes, we should know that we're saying yes to a commission. It is a command. It was not a request. We don't get to choose. Really, the only reason that is acceptable is yes. Because it is a commission. So Isaiah would start in verse 1 as we have read. And this commission that we're talking about, it's very important that we understand it is a commission. And we need to understand it is a commission from who? And it is a commission from God. And Isaiah knows very well in this verse is who God is. He said, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. And two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. Understanding that it is a commission that he responded to. 
But at the same time, understanding that it a commission coming from God. And Isaiah said, he is holy. 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 Now, it is very important for us to know and be reminded that God is holy. Because that gives us the right perspective of who it is that commissioning us. And if God is holy, subsequently, we're going to realize, just as Isaiah realized, that he is a sinful man in front of a holy God. It puts Isaiah to his proper place. We cannot appreciate sometimes the command, the commission that we receive from God because we fail to appreciate the very nature of God. But once we see God being on the throne, holy, and we are reminded of the, our true relationship with a holy God, then we also understand not only who it is that's commissioning us, but we'll also understand that that commission is an honor. It's a privilege because there is no way we deserve to be commissioned by God. Isaiah said, I'm a sinner. Imagine Isaiah saying that. We know all of us are sinners, but imagine somebody you're looking up to and you're saying that uh, when I grew up, I would like to be that person. And that person testifying before you that in front of the Holy God, I'm really nobody. And yet I'm privileged, I'm honored to be commissioned by God, to be given this responsibility. To be a spokesperson. A prophet is a spokesperson. One of the awards that we gave at the Heritage is a Kirooks Award. And Kirooks basically means a herald, a spokesperson. So you could say that a preacher is a Old Testament counterpart of prophets. Because both are spokesperson of God. So can you imagine being a spokesperson of a holy God? Knowing that you are in and of yourself a sinner and you fall short of God's glory. It's going to resize everything in its proper order of who we are in front of the Holy God. But also, it didn't stop there. Knowing who God is and knowing who we are, the good news is that Isaiah in his encounter, he said, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinful man. And here it says that then he said, I woe to me for I am ruined because I am a man of a clean lips, and I live with people of a clean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. While he was a sinner, he was made clean before the holy God. But that's not of his own doing. It was imputed to him by God. And so, Isaiah is now worthy to be in front of the holy God, not because of himself, but it, because of what God has done. It will foreshadow, this event right here will foreshadow what Christ is going to do on the cross. That our presence before the Holy God 
is not by accident. It is because of the power of the blood of the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, which is our atoning sacrifice for our sin. And so that's what we could see here. By realizing that it is a commission by the Holy God to a sinful man like me, but made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ, then that's going to give me this mindset of I am honored, I am privileged to be talking about the word of God, to be preaching the word of God. The next one is we say yes to communicating Christ. What is the message? For Isaiah, God said, you go talk to the people, here's the message. Basically, the message of repentance. The message that we take is the message of the kingdom. And the message that we take is the gospel message. At the center, the core of that gospel message is the message of Christ. Now, I'm trying to use the word uh, communicate, not only so it would have the same beginning with the word uh, uh, commission. But so to remind us, because typically we say, okay, so it's preaching. Uh, I don't preach, so that's not my responsibility. But really the gospel message is communicating Christ to other people. And by using the word communication, communication uh, would have three specific uh, uh, important uh, items in it. So we always say that communication to be effective has to be clear, concise, and consistent. So what is the message? What are we trying to communicate? We're trying to communicate Christ and the goodness that comes with Jesus Christ. So until we, until we realize how good it is, that we don't have to be perfect to be saved. But what we need to do is to be looking at Christ and the cross of Christ. And we put our faith, our trust in him and be obedient to what he tells us. We're not going to realize that it's really a good news. Because it's not about me and how good I am because I'm not. So the message is Christ and the cross of Christ. So Paul would say it over and over again. I don't want to preach anything other than the cross of Christ. That is the gospel message. In a nutshell. That is the gospel message. So we communicate Christ. But there is no way we could communicate Christ if we don't know who Christ is. And again, very basic for us, we have to study the Bible to know who Jesus is. That's how God communicated to us who Christ is. It's through his words, and as we study the word of God, we learn more about who Christ is. So we need to make the message clear, but also at the same time, concise. To somebody who is lost, you could actually tell them the gospel message in one sitting. I mean, if they need more information about the entire book of the Old Testament and New Testament, you could do that. What I'm trying to say is that when it comes to what they need to hear about being saved, about being forgiven of sin, it doesn't have to be very long. If we know how to go about explaining it and where to point them out in the scripture. But also, the next, the next thing is we have to be consistent. Consistent in how we present the gospel, but at the same time consistent with how we live our life. 
So, because sometimes people are not going to listen to us if they see that we don't do what we say. And perhaps that would be the most difficult sometimes, part of communicating Christ to other people. We have to be consistent in what we say with how we live our life. And then the next one is we say yes with confidence. So earlier we, we read verses 9 and 10. And in verses 9 and 10, after God said, whom we're going to send, Isaiah said, here am, here am I, send me. Okay. Some, someone said it's almost a comedy skit because God was asking. It was only Isaiah he's in front of him. So we don't know if Isaiah started looking to his life and to his right and to his left and really didn't see in anyone but himself. And so Isaiah volunteered and said, here am I, send me. I don't think that was the case. I think Isaiah said yes to the commission with confidence. And so later on, when he was told by God, okay, you're, I'm sending you to, the, to, to Israel, to the nation of Israel, but mind you, they're not going to listen to you. You continue preaching anyway. And then in verse 11, Isaiah asked at least this question. He said, as if he's saying, okay, Lord, it's going to be difficult. They're not going to listen to me. But here's my question. How long? And then this is the answer that Isaiah got from God. And it's, it's very good. I mean, if until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men from afar away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, yet there will be a tent portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like the terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is filled, the holy seed, seed is its stump. So basically, God is saying, you just keep on preaching. Why? They're not going to listen to me. Why do I have to keep preaching? Why do I have to keep doing what I'm doing? If they're not going to listen to me. If I'm going to face difficulties after difficulties after difficulties. Because God said there will be a remnant. A stump. What God is saying there is hope. You keep preaching because even though many are not going to listen, but there are those who are going to become remnant. There, are there is hope in what you do. We wake up every morning, whatever it is we're doing, because there's hope. There's hope that today will be better than yesterday. In ministry, we might encounter a lot of difficulties, but we wake up in the morning anyway because there is hope. And if you want to be more personal about that, talk about families. Talk about the communities. Talk about the church. Talk about work. You, won't, you wake up in the morning Believing confidently that there is hope. So why Isaiah could face tomorrow with confidence? With hope. Because Isaiah knew from the very beginning that his the measure of his success is not based on the response of Israel, but in his faithfulness to the one who called him because he is faithful. It's all based on the faithfulness of God. So Isaiah continued. 
When you get into ministry, when we get into ministry again or any responsibility that, that uh, is given to us by God, our confidence should not be on our own strength. And it should not be on the response of other people or the outcome that we could get out of it. It should all, our confidence should always be in God, it should always be in Christ. Now, Paul, it, Paul would say it in many different ways, but one of the most popular one would be Philippians 121. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Paul, Paul would be one of those apostles who will face many difficulties. But he persevere and he continues. Because he knows from the very beginning that he is confident and he is confident because his confidence is based on the one who called him. So we should know that it is a commission. We, we're saying yes to a commission from the Holy God. We're saying yes to the message, which is to communicate Christ. And we should take on that responsibility with confidence, knowing that God is faithful. Now, interestingly, this verses 9 and 10 that we read earlier, where God said they have he ears, but they're not going to listen. They have eyes, but they're not going to see. So they're not going to understand. This is one of the most quoted verses in the New Testament, at least five times. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. Quoted by all four gospel writers and then Paul. Written by Luke. And so we go to one of the passages in the New Testament. That it was quoted and it was quoted by Christ. In Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, Christ just got done telling the crowd about the parable of the sower. And then after he preached... To them, through a parable, they listened to Christ, and then according to the text, they left. And then the disciples stayed, but the disciples also didn't know. They were confused about what's the meaning of the parable. And so they asked Jesus. And so Jesus is, would explain to them the meaning of the parable, but first, he's going to quote Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9. And he said, You, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. And then he goes on to explain that the seed, the three S's, the seed is the word of God. The message coming from God. It's specifically in the text, the kingdom of God. The other S is the sower. And Matthew would call it the parable of the sower. The sower basically is faithful in scattering, broadcasting the seed. That's his work and he was faithful in doing that. There is a message to learn about the sower that Christ is talking about. Not just for himself, but especially for the disciples who were listening because they are being trained by Christ to sow the seed of the kingdom. And there are important principles that could be learned here. But also, there's a lesson regard about the sower, uh, the, the soil. And Christ is going to say there are four types of soil that receive the same seed, scattered by the same sower. But the response are all different. The difference is the heart, the condition of the heart. Some hearts are hard. The seed, the word of God would just bounce off. Some are rocky, stony. 
it will sprang out, but the heat of the sun, the difficulties of life is going to wither it away. Some are like thorny ground. It will be choked. Not just by difficulties, but could also be choked up by pleasures. Although we say that uh, the competition of the word of God in our hearts mostly are, are the difficult things that we experience. But, but really in many cases, it's the competition. And the competition are going to be the good things that we are after. That we're working hard, very hard to get. And it becomes a competition for the word of God. The pleasures of this world. We get too busy doing things that we think are good. And then it takes us away from, from God. And so we, we, we say that sometimes we have to be very careful by what we pray for. Because sometimes what we pray for are blessings from God. Are good things. But sometimes once we get them, it's the very same thing that we prayed for that choke up our relationship with God because it becomes our priority. And then, of course, there's the, the good soil. So why it's good? It's because it took in the word of God. The person hears the word of God and responded. If you are not a Christian listening to the sermon today, the invitation is yours. If you need to talk to someone else and know more about the, the will of God, the word of God that you need to respond to, so you could express your faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, there will be some men in the congregation. Jed is here. who will be willing to sit down with you and talk more about Christ. Because he is the message. He is the hope that we're talking about earlier. But also at the same time, for us Christians, there's a message here in Luke chapter 8. So you say that the good soil were able to produce harvest tenfold 100 fold even the question is what is that what is that harvest if you go to other texts then probably you could have a glimpse of what those fruits are what those harvests are but i think in the text itself what is being highlighted especially in the next verse is simply this Verse 16, or let me read uh, 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they, uh, 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. Now he... Now no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has to him shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. It's a different parable. It's a parable about the lamp. But the way Luke would write it, as Christ would discuss these different parables, they would put them all together. As if telling the reader, Luke's reader, that the fruit that come out of us listening to Jesus being disciples of Christ is that we would be the lamp, the light of the word. And naturally, if you're going to light one, you're not going to hit it. 
you light it for a purpose, and that is to light the path of those who are in the room. People who listen to Christ, people who are Christians, we have a responsibility, and that is to become that light for other people. It's what come out of us because of who we are in Christ. We are the light of the world. But nonetheless, we should be willing to be the light, to shine in the darkness. Thank you.